Okay, so welcome to the uh, afternoon session of the first day of this uh, NIST workshop. Uh, I just want to make a brief announcement before we get started with the talk, which is that uh, there will be a, a photo done for the workshop, which is going to be um, at the end of this session, it's going to be held outside, um, so in the, in the grass, kind of facing the building. So um, we'll make another, another announcement as well at the end, but um, you know, we'll go out the doors and there will be folks directing you uh, to the outside where we'll take that photo. Um, so um, without any further ado, it's, uh, it's a pleasure to introduce John Pasco from Caltech. Uh, John has given us not only you know, the term NISC, but I think also a lot of insight into what we uh, might try to do in the NISC era, and today he's going to tell us about uh, quantum speedups in the NISC era. All right, thank you, Andrew. I made up a word. <laughs> and I named a workshop after it. <laughs> and people came. <laughs> it's pretty cool. Graham Smith asked, why aren't we calling this meeting NISCI Business? <laughs> it seems like a missed opportunity, but I'm thinking that if I decide to get a new puppy, I'm going to name her NISCI. <laughs> As we've heard, NISC means noisy intermediate scale quantum. Devices of sufficient scale that we can't simulate them by brute force, even using the most powerful available classical supercomputers. But noisy reminds us that these devices will not be error corrected and noise will limit their computational power. So for physicists, NISC is quite exciting. It means that we have the opportunity to explore the properties of complex, highly entangled states of many qubits in a regime which has not been experimentally accessible before. And there may be other applications besides that, but we're not sure about that. We shouldn't think that NISC is going to change the world by itself. Rather, it should be regarded as a step towards the more powerful quantum technologies we expect to develop in the future. I'm actually optimistic that quantum technology will ultimately have a big impact on the world, but we're not sure how long it's going to take. Why is NISC exciting? Well, to put it succinctly, in what could be the watchword of our discipline, classical systems cannot simulate quantum systems efficiently. And you could argue that that's the deepest thing that we've ever said about the difference between quantum and classical. So everyone in the room believes this, right? But we can't actually prove it. What are our reasons for believing it? Here are some of the reasons. We know of problems that we believe are hard classically for which we have efficient quantum algorithms. Factoring is the best known example, and we think factoring is hard because really smart people have tried for decades to come up with better factoring algorithms, but the best algorithms we have still have a runtime which is super polynomial in the size of the number to be factored. We have arguments from the complexity theorists which say, for example, that I can run a relatively small quantum computation and measure all the qubits. And under plausible assumptions, we can argue that in doing so, we are sampling from a probability distribution that we can't sample from efficiently by any classical means. But maybe the best reason we have to think quantum computing is powerful is that we just don't know how to simulate a quantum computer with a classical one. And it's not because we haven't been trying. Physicists and chemists have been trying for decades to come up with better methods for simulating highly entangled systems of many particles, but the best algorithms we have still have an exponential runtime in hard instances in the size of the system. We don't think, though, that quantum computers have unlimited power. We don't expect, for example, that we'd be able to find exact solutions to the worst case instances of NP-hard problems efficiently with a quantum computer. So this is what our map of the world looks like. And we're trying to fill in some of the details. But we still don't know a whole lot about that terrain, which is classically hard and quantumly easy. And from some perspectives, that's not so surprising. Uh, since we don't think quantum computers can efficiently solve the NP-hard problems, at least within NP, we're talking about problems that are not NP but are not NP-complete. And those have a rather special structure, in fact, some of them are suitable for constructing trapdoor one-way functions. From that point of view, it's not surprising that quantum computing has something to say about, about cryptology. But for a physicist like me, even if it couldn't do anything else, there would be a very strong incentive to realize large-scale quantum computing 
for the purpose of simulating complex physical systems. I've spent a lot of my career thinking about things like what happens in strongly coupled quantum field theory and what happens inside a black hole or in the very early universe. Arguably, these are phenomena which are hard to simulate on classical computers, and to do it with a quantum computer eventually will, I think, be very empowering and exciting. I've emphasized the number of qubits as a milestone for quantum technology. Of course, it's not the only thing we care about, as we heard this morning. We also care about the quality of the qubits, and especially the fidelity of the two qubit entangling gates that we put together in a quantum circuit. And the situation now is that under the best conditions, with superconducting or trapped ion processors, we can do a two qubit gate with a probability of error per gate of about 10 to the minus 3. Uh, we still haven't seen whether that's possible in larger devices, complex devices, containing many qubits. So naively, we can't expect to be able to execute circuits with more than a few thousand gates and read out the answer with useful signal-to-noise ratio. Even in that case, we'd probably have to run many times an average in order to estimate with some statistical significance the expectation values of observables we care about. Eventually, we know there's a way to do better using quantum error correction, but because, or perhaps by making much, much more accurate quantum gates, um, but in the case of quantum error correction, because of the high overhead costs and additional qubits and gates, that's not something that's likely to happen very soon. So what, what do we want? We want quantum speedups. We would like to be able to solve, ideally, some interesting problem with a quantum computer, which surpasses what we can do with the best classical devices. To make a fair comparison, we should consider a classical computer, which is running the best algorithm on the best hardware for solving the same problem. And maybe we should look out a little bit at what that classical hardware might achieve a few years from now when quantum computing might start to become competitive. And we should also have in mind the vexing problem that it might not be so easy to validate in the case of problems beyond NP whether the quantum computer is really getting the right answer. Now, we already have seen a number of times the lesson that sometimes we can make overly optimistic projections about what's needed to demonstrate a quantum advantage for some problem. And I won't go through this list. It could have been a longer list. One that I find particularly poignant is just a year or two ago, I'd like to point to the Karanidis Prakash algorithm for quantum recommendation systems as an encouraging example of an application of quantum technology that, at least maybe not in the NISC era, but eventually would be valuable. But uh, Ewing Tang, Tang killed that off. There may be an interesting polynomial speed up, but it's less exciting without the exponential speed up. And the other thing that kind of catches your attention from time to time is how the classical methods for studying quantum problems, tensor network methods in particular, have continued to improve. And they can compute a lot of things now that they couldn't say computers and which quantum computers can solve. Well, if that depresses you a little bit, this is supposed to buck you up a little. I learned this from Nevin. I'm calling it Nevin's Law in his honor. Uh, he says that the classical resources that you need to simulate a quantum computer are actually growing doubly exponential in time. The argument is based on some rather du dubious assumptions, but I'll I'll tell you the uh, idea anyway. Uh, you might argue that, looking at recent history, that two qubit gate fidelities have been improving exponentially in time. And that means, roughly speaking, that the volume of a quantum circuit that we can execute reliably with a quantum computer is growing exponentially in time. But the classical cost of simulating that quantum computation scales roughly exponentially with the volume. and so. As a function of time, what we can, the cost of simulating the quantum computer is growing doubly exponentially. So from that point of view, the quantum uh, computer is uh, taking off like a rocket, poised to surpass its classical competition, but it doesn't exactly tell us when we're going to be able to run interesting applications. 
So what are we going to do with these NISC processors? There's an emerging paradigm of what we might try to do, namely hybrid quantum classical methods for solving optimization problems, where we would execute some uh, reasonable sized quantum circuit, measure the qubits, feed those measurement outcomes to a classical computer, which would return instructions about how to slightly modify the quantum circuit. And then we would repeat that cycle with the goal of optimizing some cost function. As I've said, we don't expect quantum computers to be able to solve exactly worst case instances of NP hard problems, but they might be able to find better approximate solutions or find them faster, at least that's the hope. And when we apply this method to classical optimization problems, it usually goes by the name QAOA, and when we apply it to quantum problems, like finding low energy eigenstates of a Hamiltonian, we call it BQE, but it's essentially the same idea. So should we expect this type of method to actually outperform classical computers in the relatively near term for problems that we care about? I don't know. But we should try it and see how well it works and experiment and try to improve the method, uh, quoting Eddie. It's a lot to ask because these classical algorithms are pretty good and people have been improving them over decades. And meanwhile, the NIST processor coming right out of the box isn't exactly expected to um, win the race right off the bat. Now, one thing that we worry about is that the classical side of this routine can be very computationally demanding. And naively, you might expect that we have to increase the number of variational parameters that we're optimizing over on the classical side as we increase the size of the quantum instance. And that makes that classical problem uh, quite challenging. So what are we going to do about that? Well, one idea, which I think is just based on numerical evidence from this Google group studying max cut, is they claim uh, in numerically simula simulating QAOA on a classical computer that when they fix the parameters for small instances, that gives them a good starting point for looking for optimal parameters for larger instances. I'm not sure why that's true, but they claim there's evidence for that. It may be that we should confine our attention, or at least focus our attention, on cases where there's enough symmetry, where we plausibly won't need a great number of variational parameters to get good answers, for example, in translation invariant quantum systems. But what kind of looms over the subject is we don't have a very persuasive theoretical argument why this type of quantum method should outperform classical methods, as Hastings recently articulated. Now, if you want a little bit of optimism to brighten your day, you can talk to Peter Shore. He's an optimistic guy. And he likes to point out that there are many cases in the history of classical computing when there were algorithms which performed quite well, but where theorists were not able in advance to predict or explain that they would work well. And a current example of that is deep learning, which is having a big impact on the world. But we still have a very limited theoretical understanding of why these classical networks can be trained efficiently for many interesting examples. And so maybe it'll be like that with near-term quantum algorithms. We'll fool around, we'll experiment, and we'll discover applications which we can't initially explain why they work as well as they do. But because we're limited by the noise to relatively small circuits, it's likely to take a vibrant dialogue between the application users and the quantum algorithm experts to find useful applications in the near term. So how should we discover applications? Uh, it's often a good idea to go to Scott for wisdom. I heard him say this at a re recent meeting, so I wrote it down. Instead of thinking of a hard problem and asking how to speed it up, ask what quantum computers are good at and build an application from that. And it was in that spirit that Scott came up with the idea of generating certified randomness with a NIST device. Well, the idea is that once we have a sufficiently complex NIST device, a client can send instructions to the quantum server to execute a certain quantum circuit and read it out and demand that the response come so quickly that it couldn't have been produced by a classical computer. And then we can argue that there must have been a lot of 
entropy uh, generated by the quantum computation, which we can then extract to get randomness, which we believe is uh, really uh, independent of the rest of the world. And there are a lot of interesting open questions about this, which should still be studied. And I guess the other application, which is kind of in the same spirit, is quantum dynamics, as Feynman initially envisioned, that if we want to take advantage of what the quantum computer is good at, we should study the problem of how quantum systems evolve in time. But it's a good question. What else fits into this category of using what the quantum computer is good at and building applications from that? Another way to inspire applications is to offer money, um, like a prize for a demonstration of quantum advantage which has a significant economic impact or societal value. And that would be judged by a carefully chosen committee of wise women, men and women, whether that criteria would satisfy. And you might think this is sort of a, you know, if you're a cynic, a kind of a shameless uh, publicity stunt. But actually, the, the philosophy of it kind of interests me, which is here we have this billion dollar quantum market, so there's plenty of incentive to come up with applications. Everybody wants them. So why should you even bother to offer a million dollars, which is you know, peanuts in comparison. But human nature being what it is, it does perhaps provide a uh, incentive for some people to focus on the issue. I was talking to Peter Love about this recently, and he pointed out to me that uh, there's been discussion for some time about how we could potentially use a market to reach judgments about what problems or instances of problems are hard by uh, buying and selling tokens or options or setting up a derivatives market. And you can imagine uh, variants on that idea which would price potential societal value and potential quantum advantage compared to classical algorithms. And in a way, we have that already because we have a quantum market, not to mention the incentives that are baked into academia. But it's kind of interesting to think about if you were trying to design that market to enhance uh, the probability of discovering important applications, whether there are mechanisms to build in uh, that aren't currently there. I thought from time to time that we ought to have a quantum algorithms petting zoo, inspired by quantum algorithm zoo, that is, with a focus on the problems that potentially could run as NISC applications. I'm not sure what the criterion should be for enrollment in the zoo, but I would put the bar pretty low. It would be nice to have some clearinghouse of potential applications that we can uh, build and uh, consult in seeking important applications. And of course, meetings are important too. Um, and it's particularly useful to have encouraged interactions among the quantumists with uh, domain experts in optimization and chemistry and so on, and the eventual end users. Well, because I like oxymorons, I like what Jordan said about quantum machine learning. It's overhyped but underestimated. And I kind of see what he means. It's natural to ask what happens when we put quantum information processing and machine learning together. Um, it may be that for some applications, we can more efficiently train a quantum network. We don't really know whether that's true, but we can try it and see how well it works. Part of the reason for hopefulness about quantum machine learning comes from the idea of QRAM that, in principle, I can very uh, succinctly encode a large amount of classical data with an exponential savings in space in uh, a set of qubits. But the applications or proposed ones of QRAM to machine learning problems often run into input-output bottlenecks, uh, namely, if I have classical data and I need to load it into QRAM, that can be quite slow, nullifying a potential quantum advantage. And the output from the network will be a quantum state, so we can only, in each shot, collect a limited amount of information from it by measuring it. So it might be more natural in seeking quantum advantage in machine learning to think about quantum machine learning as a task in which both the input and the output are quantum states, which we could use to learn how to better characterize or control quantum systems. It makes sense that if there's going to be a quantum advantage in machine learning, if we're trying to, by training, learn about some 
probability distribution, the quantum advantage might be there if quantum entanglement underlies that distribution. So things that we might think about are, for example, we heard about using quantum error correction and sensing this morning from Paula. Um, the general task is to find entangled multi-sensor states, which provide some suppression of the noise without killing the signal. And quantum machine learning might be a method well suited for that kind of task. A good slogan for us is recognizing phases is harder than recognizing faces. In the case where the phase is topological and there's no local order parameter, and a quantum network, and this has been uh, discussed by a number of people lately, uh, might be well suited for identifying quantum phases. There's been a lot of discussion of using classical machine learning with the input some succinct classical description of a quantum state for classic classifying phases, but it might also be a good task for a quantum network where we can think of each phase having some representative model, like an exactly solvable model, and another state in that phase is that reference state, but with some noise attached to it, and the task of the network is to try to get rid of the noise through a sequence of coarse graining steps and error correction steps. Another thing that uh, is worth considering is using quantum machine learning for the purpose of finding better codes and decoding methods for physical noise models in the lab, in particular for correlated noise. And because there's a lot of interest now in classical machine learning applied to chemical discovery and also a lot of interest in the applications of quantum computing to chemistry, there might be a sweet spot where relatively near-term quantum machine learning uh, can lead us to new discoveries in chemistry. I think in general, in both the quantum and the classical setting, there's a lot more that uh, we might be able to do by thinking about machine learning from the point of view of renormalization group and error correction to understand the applications that work and find new ones. So the problem that we think quantum computers are especially well suited for is quantum simulation. We think simulating dynamics is particularly hard because people have tried to do it and are very bad at it. Um, quantum computers will be able to do simulations of quantum systems and the potential applications could have a profound impact eventually, though perhaps not in the NIST era, on human health and agriculture and the sustainability of the planet and so on. Probably those aren't going to be realized, at least not to that extent in the NISC era. And because classical computers are particularly bad at simulating dynamics, that seems to be a great opportunity for quantum advantage. We might think of it this way, that back in the 60s and 70s, when people started to simulate nonlinear classical systems using classical computers, that greatly advanced our understanding of chaos in classical dynamical systems. And as of now, we don't really know very much about quantum chaos, but in quantum simulations, we might be able to learn about it relatively soon. Now, when I've made this argument um, that quantum simulation is the natural place to look for quantum advantage, sometimes people push back, like Frank Verstrada said this to me, um, well, quantum dynamics isn't interesting at all because there are two kinds of systems. There are the localized systems and they're not very highly entangled and they equilibrate very, very slowly, and they're probably, they might be easy to simulate classically, and they don't do much. And on the other hand, there are the strongly chaotic systems, and they converge to thermal equilibrium very quickly. We can't simulate that process because entanglement grows very quickly, but on the other hand, nothing interesting happens. They just converge to thermal equilibrium, and that's it. And I think the right response is, uh, you can get interesting answers, but you have to ask interesting questions. And this is, this is fun for theorists because it's inviting us to think like experimental physicists who have to deal with the question, I have certain capabilities in the laboratory and how can I use them to make an interesting discovery? And I think there are a lot of situations where the classical simulation is hard because entanglement grows quickly but would not be subject 
second half of Ristrata's objection, one thing I've been interested in for a while, although it's not necessarily going to be a NISC application, is applying quantum simulation to strongly coupled quantum field theory, where, for example, if you wanted to study a high energy collision which generates a large amount of entanglement, something interesting is happening that you might be able or want to characterize, uh, but it's hard to simulate classically. <coughs> now, we can do either digital or analog quantum simulation. By an analog quantum simulator, we mean some system whose Hamiltonian we can control pretty well, which behaves like some quantum system that we're interested in studying or simulating. Whereas by a digital quantum computer or quantum simulator, we mean a general purpose quantum computer, which we can use to simulate any physical system of interest when we suitably program it. Now, analog quantum simulation is an activity which has been very active for over 15 years. Digital quantum simulation is just getting started. Some of the same experimental platforms, though, can be used for both purposes. Now, analog simulators ultimately are limited because we have imperfect control of the Hamiltonian and limited ability to control the noise. Um, they're best suited for studying properties which are robust with respect to such noise sources. Eventually, digital quantum computing will overcome that limitation because we can error correct them, but that's not going to happen probably for a long time. So in the near term, analog quantum simulators offer a lot of potential for teaching us about new physical phenomena. So we should be asking, what are the hard problems that we can solve with analog simulators, even when there we have imperfect control? And in the NIST era, is there really a point to doing digital quantum simulation at all? In particular, for the purpose of simulating time evolution, well, that requires rather deep circuits by the methods that we know about. And so it might not be possible to do it with reasonable accuracy using NIST devices. But digital has advantages. It gives us more flexibility in the Hamiltonians that we can study and in the types of initial states we can prepare. It gives us opportunities for hybrid methods where some of the load is carried classically. For example, using a classical compu computer to find a succinct description like a tensor network description or maybe some kind of uh, classical network description of an initial quantum state, which can then be compiled as a quantum circuit, which we can load into a general purpose quantum computer and then uh, study or evolve. So I think there is a point to doing digital simulation with NIST devices, but a lot of what we'll learn will be not necessarily deep properties of the physical systems that we're studying, but we'll be laying the foundations for doing more reliable simulations in the future where we really will see a substantial payoff in our understanding of fundamental physical science. And actually, you could say a similar thing about almost all NISC uh, applications, that we should think of them as sort of setting the stage for more useful applications, which may come later. Incidentally, I mean, analog quantum simulators can do uh, some rather amazing things, and arguably, they're already being used to study highly correlated phenomena in many particle systems, which are quite hard to simulate on classical computers. And I just gave a couple of examples here. Now, I assume Misha is going to talk about this, but I wanted to highlight it as an example from which we should uh, take some encouragement. A uh, simulation done by his group of quantum dynamics in a simulator with 51 Rydberg atoms. So as I already alluded to earlier, uh, we tend to think that there are two uh, generic ways in which physical systems which are closed can uh, converge to equilibrium. Uh, we can have many body localization where perhaps due to strong disorder, uh, the system is not so highly entangled and thermalizes very slowly, um, but there can also be strongly chaotic systems which converge to equilibrium very quickly. And what was found in this simulation is a kind of intermediate case of regime in the uh, phase diagram where both types of states coexist, where some of the states thermalize quickly 
and some take much longer to thermalize. And that's quite, quite interesting and maybe a signature of a new class of quantum matter far from equilibrium, which has been called uh, a quantum many body scar state, which just means that there are atypical only slightly entangled non-thermal eigenstates in a system which is non-integrable and also has thermal states. And it's not clear uh, at this point, uh, at least to me, whether this involves some kind of fine tuning of the Hamiltonian or how generic a phenomenon it is. But I think the good news is in this one of the earliest simulations to study quantum dynamics in a regime which is not so easy to simulate, classically a new phenomenon was found. And I assume Peter is going to talk about this tomorrow, but I wanted to highlight it also as sort of the state of the art of variational computations using quantum platforms. You could view this as a kind of intermediate case between digital and analog. It's an analog system with some digital controls. In this case, it's an ion trap uh, in an experiment done by uh, Reiner Blotz group at Innsbruck. And as we heard from Chris, the ion trap has its own native Hamiltonian, but that Hamiltonian is tunable. So in preparing a quantum state, we can start with some initial state, evolve according to some specified Hamiltonian for a certain amount of time, rapidly switch to a new Hamiltonian and evolve for some amount of time, and so on with uh, some number of steps, which is experimentally feasible, and then treat the parameters in that protocol as variational parameters. And even if we can't control the Hamiltonian very precisely, as long as the control errors are reproducible, that isn't an obstacle to using this method in variational calculations. And that group used it to study the low energy states of electrodynamics in one dimension. It was a 20 qubit simulation, and they got results which were in good agreement with exact diagonalization, which can be done for a system which is that small. And they also had this nice feature that there's some self-verification built in to uh, the protocol uh, they can uh, estimate, because for this system, the expectation value of the Hamiltonian minus some specified constant squared is just a sum of poly operators for a state prepared in this way with fixed values of the parameters. They can measure all those expectation values of poly operators by running many times and therefore estimate the expectation value of this quantity in that state, and when E is actually an energy eigenvalue, that should be consistent with zero. And so we have a way of checking that we're getting a state that it behaves like an energy eigenstate. So this was done with 20 ions. Probably uh, it could be done with more. And what's encouraging in this case is there doesn't seem to be any sign of decoherence being a limitation on the reliability of the device. But it is running into this problem that the classical side of the loop is pretty demanding, and a lot of the effort in doing this calculation was on that classical side. There was one other thing that I wanted to highlight, which is a recent theoretical development, just as an example of how there may be other methods apart from QAOA uh, VQE for using relatively low depth circuits for quantum problems. Um, and maybe evading that problem that the classical loop is so difficult. In simulations on classical computers of quantum systems, imaginary time evolution is often used. That's a relatively efficient way of preparing low energy states of the system. And we know how to simulate such non-unitary operators on a quantum computer, but it's very expensive because we do it by introducing ancilla qubits and measuring them and post-selecting. But in this recent paper by uh, Garnet Chan and collaborators, they proposed a more efficient way of applying a contractive map like this one to a particular input state. We don't have to simulate the operator, only its action on a particular state. And through a combination of state tomography and solving some uh, linear equations, which is classically pretty easy, one can find the right unitary that does the job up to a rescaling. And the circuit that's involved is relatively low depth uh, compared to uh, some other uh, non-NISC uh, quantum simulation algorithms. 
at least this seems to work okay as long as we don't have a divergent correlation length, in which case the uh, depth of the circuit that we need to get good accuracy blows up. So I'm not really sure how well this is going to work in practice, but I'm just pointing to it as an example of how we, we need to continue to think of new ideas for using relatively low depth circuits for studying quantum problems. Now these NISC era quantum devices are not going to have error correction. And as I've been emphasizing, the noise puts a limitation on them. Uh, we understand that the ultimate solution to that will be quantum error correction, but there's very high overhead cost. And how high that cost is depends on the quality of the hardware that we use and the algorithm that we run. Uh, a recent estimate is that if we have a gate error rate of 10 to the minus 3 for two qubit gates, we need 20 million physical qubits to uh, break RSA 2048 running Shor's algorithm. So if we're going to get into that scalable regime, we have a very daunting quantum chasm to cross from where we expect to be in the next few years with the order 100 qubits or so, or maybe a few hundred, and where we want to go, which is millions of physical qubits. And so the mainstream users who are eagerly awaiting quantum computers for solving their problems may have to be patient. But meanwhile, having the advances that we need to bring fault-tolerant quantum computing closer to realization are continuing to be very important. And it's a combination of many things that are needed. Certainly, having better two-qubit gates will help a lot, as well as theoretical ideas about doing error correction with lower overhead and better design of algorithms and so on. Now, what about the near term? In the long run, we'll have quantum error correcting codes, and we will have uh, fault tolerant protocols. In the NISC era, uh, at least to begin with, we'll be trying protocols that aren't really making use of error correction at all. What should come in between? Well, the problem is, naively, if you have a generic circuit with G gates, you'll need an error per gate scaling like 1 over g to have a reasonable chance of getting the right answer. That's assuming that um, the answer is sensitive to a fault at any circuit location. But that isn't always necessarily the case, depending on the problem that we're trying to solve. If we, in some uh, physics simulation, want to measure few point correlation functions, then we might be able to tolerate some constant probability of error uh, per qubit, and for some of the methods that have been proposed for NISC era uh, exploration of low energy quantum states, the quantum circuits that prepare the states have some built in error resilience so that faults early in the circuit have an effect that decays away at a later time. Other ideas that have been suggested are extrapolating to the zero noise limit. For example, we can vary the amount of time over which we execute a thermal gate, uh, sorry, a quantum gate, and therefore uh, adjust the noise in the gate, and then from results with various values of the noise strength, try to extrapolate to the limit of zero noise, and that method is already being used in some of the early NISC uh, simulations. And there are other ideas about how we might use resampling methods to get estimates of the expectation values of the observable that we're trying to measure without just doing a naive averaging of all the outcomes. We need more ideas like that. So I think the first event like this one that I remember attending was in 2013 at IBM. It was called, What Do We Do With a Small Quantum Computer? And one of the answers that uh, some of us gave at the time is we should be using it to learn how to build a big quantum computer. And I think that's still a good answer, not the only answer, but one of the good answers. And for those of us who are already working on quantum error correction over 20 years ago, um, it's kind of exciting to think that we'll really be doing quantum error correction in a serious way in the lab during the NISC era. Um, but we'll be doing it, of course, initially at a rather small scale. So you can ask whether we really learn interesting things from that. I think we could learn a lot of interesting things. Uh, one of the things we can get better at is understanding uh, how to correct and mitigate leakage. Uh, there's a lot of reason to worry about crosstalk, and we need methods for characterizing it better and understanding how to mitigate it, either by compiling our algorithms suitably or by using coding methods 
that are um, well suited for dealing with correlated noise. There are a lot of methods that uh, have been proposed for uh, tailoring the noise or for engineering dissipation so as to provide some at least partial error correction and testing how well those methods work in real devices is sure to be instructive. Doing logical benchmarking, that is measuring error rates of logical gates, will be a good way of testing reliability of NIST scale systems and may also teach us things about how well error correction works in the real world. Uh, at least initially, we can uh, do what I'll call a post-selected fault tolerance, that is use error detecting codes instead of error correcting code that doesn't scale well. Uh, but it could give us some useful information about the nature of correlated noise and the things that we can do to deal with it. There are some clever ideas uh, that have been proposed for diagnosing when errors produce, uh, faults produce errors that spread badly, that propagate badly, to lower the cost in ancilla qubits of fault tolerant protocols. And uh, those will be interesting to try out and study, though it's not clear how scalable they are. But I think it's a real adventure to seek the eternal qubit, having qubits which, by means of quantum error correction, have a very long lifetime compared to the natural lifetime in the quantum device, will be a real milestone for our field. And in not too many years, we may have a lot of encouragement, or possibly not, concerning the prospects for scalability using the quantum error correction tools that we know about. And we also have good prospects for improving them uh, through experimentation. And of course, we all want better gates. And the ongoing efforts, for example, to develop topological qubits or other methods for uh, controlling noise at the hardware level continue to be very important. OK, so let me sum up. We're entering the NIST era, and we're all eager to see whether NIST devices will be able to outperform our best classical computers. That's possible, but we don't really know for sure whether it's going to happen. We will be able to experiment with and test the hybrid quantum classical methods that have been suggested for solving optimization problems. We should keep noise resilience in mind in designing our near-term application. Quantum dynamics seems to be a particularly interesting target for quantum advantage because it's so hard to simulate in highly entangled systems using classical computers. By fooling around with our NIST devices, we may have opportunities to discover new applications that work better than theorists can initially explain. We shouldn't expect NIST to change the world. Really, the goal should be to pave the way for the bigger payoffs that we'll find with future devices. There's a very strong incentive to continue lowering the two qubit gate error rate. In the NIST era, that will mean we'll be able to study and execute deeper circuits. And in the longer run, it will mean a lower overhead cost for fault tolerant quantum computing. Um, that quest for fault tolerant quantum computing shouldn't uh, be far from our thoughts. I think it's the key to our quantum future. And progress towards fault tolerant quantum computing should continue to be a high priority for quantum technologists. But in short, um, these are exciting times. And I think we have a lot to look forward to in the next few years and beyond. So thank you very much. John, for that inspiring talk, and I think we have time for a few questions. Um, so you talked about, uh, first you compared um, you know, analog versus digital simulation mm -hmm. of quantum states. And then you talk later about um, sort of a programmable analog computer. And I was wondering to what extent these, um, to what extent advances in digital computers can help us do analog simulations. For example, if IonQ was able to build 
a 1,000 qubit device next year, would that be something that we could use for analog um, <coughs> simulations, or is the gap just too big? And likewise, I guess, for superconducting qubits. Well, I mean, I'm sure they'd be able to use it to, u to do interesting things. Um, so the, the type of simulation I described, which was of a, you know, finding low energy states, in particular the ground state of a one-dimensional system, I think is probably not a very promising path to quantum advantage because we have such good classical methods for um, doing one-dimensional physics like um, you know, density matrix or normalization group methods. Uh, two dimensions and beyond are much more interesting. Now, in fact, in the case, because of the all-to-all -all connectivity of an ion trap, the, uh, the geometry of the system was not very important in that simulation that I described using 20 ions. And as a matter of fact, the way they do it is they integrate out the photon from one-dimensional electrodynamics, and then they get a, a kind of non-local spin model, which is what they study. Uh, but with, with 20 or 50 qubits, you wouldn't be able to study a two-dimensional system of a size, which is probably going to be very physically re revealing. With 1,000, uh, then, I, yeah, maybe it, it starts to get very interesting with 1,000. I think, you know, the other thing is uh, that um, dynamics, as I said, may be the, uh, the more promising path towards quantum advantage. And with a 1,000 ion ion trap, with all the all connectivity, I think there are studies of dynamics that would be very interesting uh, to understand in a you know, sharper, more detailed way than we can with current experiments. For example, the scrambling behavior of strongly chaotic systems. Another question here in the back. I was going to ask you if you could elaborate a little bit on uh, quantum dynamics, how it can be leveraged. And I'm wondering how uh, periodically driven systems uh, might uh, play into that equation. Any thoughts yeah. on that? So I guess the first part of the question is, what, what is it about quantum dynamics that's, that's so interesting? Um, and the second part is, um, are there particularly interesting opportunities in the case of periodically driven systems? Uh, well, in fact, uh, I think in the answer to the second question is uh, yes. And in general, um, the types of quantum phenomena that occur in driven systems that are highly entangled, we have very poor theoretical control over. So, and there have already been very interesting experiments studying um, phenomena like time crystals in a periodically driven systems. And there will be opportunities to explore that much more accurately and in more detail, um, I hope, in the next era. As far as why, uh, what are we going to learn from quantum dynamics? Um, I, uh, like I said, I don't know that it's really going to be a NISC era uh, application. Well, let me put it this way. There are lots of dynamical phenomena that we would like to study in correlated systems, including in condensed matter. When you have a strongly correlated system, uh, just studying properties like transport and conductivity and viscosity and so on, analytically, extremely hard and maybe most naturally studied in a dynamical simulation rather than a static one. So I think there will be lots of opportunities like that. I'm interested in things like um, what happens in quantum field theories that are far from equilibrium. And I think we can do baby versions of those types of simulations in the NISC era. I don't know if we'll really see big physics impact from that, but we'll be setting the stage for impact later on. Maybe we have time for one more quick question if there is one, while Dave gets set up. So I don't know what your favorite uh, metric is, um, but uh, there's this quantum volume versus the uh, supremacy versus you mentioned quantum advantage. Sort of what's your, what do you look at when you were to think of a metric for, you know, what we should be shooting for? Yeah, so I, the question was about what kind of metric we should use as far as what um, we, should, we should be shooting for. 
And you mentioned specifically quantum volume, which I won't explain exactly what that is, but it's, I mean, what you might naively expect. It's a measure of a combination of the, um, the width, the number of qubits, and the depth of the circuit. And it's intended to characterize roughly the classical heart doing the simulation. But I think really uh, the right way to think about it is in a, uh, you know, an application context. That if there's some application that I'm really interested in, the question is how far do we have to go with the quantum device so that we're really doing something which is beyond what we can simulate classically. I don't really think, I mean, it's useful to talk about quantum volume and other such uh, general purpose measures, but um, it uh, tells us about the cost of simulating uh, generic circuits, not necessarily ones we care about in applications. Okay, thanks. Uh, let's thank John again.